Hello everybody, welcome. Uh, before we start, this video is technically a part two to my previous video on the isekai genre and gender disparity in anime production. So while this video can mostly stand on its own, I will be referencing some stuff I have already covered, such as how in that last video I asked my audience to recommend YouTube channels run by women because the algorithm seems to promote them less. Little did you know, it was all part of my cunning plan so I could neatly compile a list of them so that now you can be recommended these channels by me. I would love to give all of these people a shout out and like a description of their channel, but unfortunately this video is going to be long enough as it is, so instead I've put them all here and I've made a master list on my Tumblr that you can go check out, link in description. And lastly, I want to thank you all for letting me reach 1,000 subscribers. I'm so incredibly grateful for your support, and from the little bits that I've been able to interact with you, y'all seem pretty cool. Um, <laughs> it seems kind of silly and self-congratulatory, but I'm just, I'm really happy. Just thank you, and I hope that I can make your day a little brighter and you'll stick with whatever I make in the future. With that all out of the way, let's start. In 2019, two anime were released with what I feel was a surprising amount of overlap in their appeal. The first of which was Dr. Stone, a shonen anime wherein humanity gets turned into stone for almost 4,000 years and has to start rebuilding civilization from scratch in what is basically the new Stone Age. This daunting process is expedited slightly by the main character Senku, who is a super genius and who theoretically could rebuild any modern technology ever just given enough material, time, and manpower. But unfortunately for him and basically the rest of humanity, one of the first people revived ends up being a radical murderer who doesn't want to rebuild civilization and builds an enemy faction opposing Senku so they have to deal with that. The appeal of Dr. Stone is the Bill Nye aspect of getting to learn about the science of how things are made and getting to see Senku remake modern technology out of basically nothing. If you've ever watched one of those really satisfying primitive build videos on YouTube where people just like make a house or bricks from scratch, it's the same appeal of watching someone make something completely from scratch with their own hands. In episode one, we even get this really cool time lapse shot that is almost exactly like one of those videos of Senku making this clay pot to distill wine. Overall, Dr. Stone is a fun, breezy shonen anime where you even get to learn a little bit. Very refreshing if you're used to boys using magic to punch other boys. Then in October, a sentence of a bookworm was released. Said bookworm, Matsuo Urano, just got her dream job of becoming a librarian where she can be surrounded by books every day until, ironically, an earthquake buries her in an avalanche of books, uh, killing her. But instead of permanently dying, she wakes up in another world, in the body of mine, a bedridden child in fantasy medieval Europe, whose family unfortunately lives in poverty. Mine's biggest problem is the class system. The noble class owns most of the wealth, and the rest of the fiefdom have limited rights and work to support people they basically never see. Her greatest wish, to read books again, would basically be impossible for someone of her status to achieve. In a pre-printing press era where monks have to meticulously scribe each book by hand. Instead, Mine has to use her knowledge of modern technology and history for her main goal to make books herself and also improve her family's standard of living. Bookworm's story has a very slow burn as it methodically takes its time setting up the world, and hence it's not something I would really recommend binging. Like, if the anime didn't completely bomb its intro by framing the first season as a flashback in the scene with a priest, we wouldn't have even known that magic is even a thing in this world until, like, episode 7 or something. So what is the core appeal of each of these shows? I should probably preface that I love both of these shows and find them both incredibly refreshing. However, I think Bookworm is, for lack of a better term, on another level than Dr. Stone. Even though I will admit I think both series are quite flawed in different ways, I think they both could have been even better than they are, and I'll attempt to explain why. Dr. Stone is a more hard science chemical industrial revolution in the Stone Age, and Bookworm has more of a focus on historical innovation. While the premise between these series is wildly different, the core appeal of each is getting to see what modern technology, Senku and Mine, will be able to make when they have such limited resources and manpower. 
But what's interesting to me is just how differently those limits are placed on each of them. On the one hand, Senku is a mad scientist slash genius, and he can make anything the plot needs. He just has access to the entire world's knowledge in his head at all times, which is why the situation he's in has to be so dire. He can't forage for leftover materials or have access to a medieval city like mine, because if he did, he'd be running it as their new god in probably less than a month. And reversely, mine couldn't thrive in the stone world because her circumstances are too stacked against her. If she had to forage for her daily meal intake by herself, alone, for months in the body of a child so sick that she has trouble walking, she would be dead within the week. Basically, the power balance has to be evenly distributed between the difficulty of the world and how competent the main character can be. And this is one of the reasons why I think Bookworm has an edge over Dr. Stone. Maltosu Urano was a normal person. She has about an average human knowledge and skills, and anything more than that is just due to her absurd love of reading. And having her be a normal person makes her infinitely more relatable as a main character than Senku. The choices that she makes are the kind that if you were thrust into her situation, you would probably try some of the same. While Senku, on the other hand, can give you the step-by-step -step instructions to make a real bomb, instructions that were clear enough that the anime had to add a don't try this at home kids disclaimer. However, practically speaking, most people aren't going to go home and make any of the things that Senku does. The appeal of Mind's inventions is that anyone could go home and make these things. Maybe not all of them, sure, but stuff like the all-in-one homemade shampoo or the crocheting are easy enough, and that is just more relatable. And when it comes to the focus of what is and what isn't important to make, I think that speaks volumes about the presentation in both of these series. Dr. Stone's creative focus. Let's break down some of Senku's inventions that we get an explanation for versus things that he just has in the time skip. So he has clothes, shoes, a home, pots, food, spears, fire making tools, and an axe. And what he makes is wine distillation and the wine making process, cement, and soap. Do you notice anything? The basic stuff that a normal person could actually make at home are just glossed over. Granted, we see more of that stuff in a later flashback, like the rope, or how to make fire, or the process of trial and error for creating stone knives. But then the rest, the pots, the house, leatherworking, pattern making, are all one second visual cutaways. Actually, it's weird that the camera almost deliberately cuts away at the sewing process. We see him leatherworking, and even cut the fabric, and then suddenly, cut! You can't even use the excuse that his clothes are just tied together toga style because you really shouldn't be able to get sleeves that way. Like, where is the seam? Is there just one under his arm? Was it cut from one piece like this? Which, fun fact, I only learned about from watching a separate show about historical fashion. I would have been very interested in knowing this, Senku. Basically, my point is, the inventions that would be considered domestic or feminine, like sewing clothing, cooking, household comforts, are not considered interesting enough to have an actual explanation for how they're made. The feminine comforts are things that we take for granted and just assume that we'll have and that they're not very hard to make, so watching someone make them wouldn't be very interesting. Which, listen, I don't want to dig too deep into this can of worms, but that is a classic representation about how quote-unquote women's work is somehow lesser. Even when Senku does engage in inventions that we would consider more domestic like cooking, like in the ramen episode, it's more about the processing of the grain than the actual cooking. Meanwhile, let's look at what Mine makes and her reasons why. The standard of living in this medieval town is frankly, well, medieval. There's no plumbing, water has to be drawn from a well, it's a ton of work so bathing isn't commonplace. That, that's nasty. So the first thing mine does is to pin her hair up because it's unwashed, oily, and nasty, which without modern elastics or ribbon is frankly harder than it should be. 
Mine's first major achievement is to make shampoo, which again is one of those basic modern human needs that nobody thinks about when it comes to survival scenarios because it's not exciting. It's not glamorous or impressive, but that's probably one of the first things that we, people who are used to the convenience and comforts of 21st century living, would miss if we were in her shoes. And there's even this throwaway line in Dr. Stone about Yuzuriha saying how hard it was to deal with her long hair in the stone world. Like, yeah, how was it hard? Are you washing your hair with the soap that you made? That probably doesn't feel amazing. Mine slowly uses her knowledge of modern technology to make things that we would consider to be everyday comforts to improve her family's standard of living. And how? Through hygiene, cooking, crocheting, and weaving. And this is putting aside the other stuff she's doing that are related to her long-term goal of making a book, which eventually leads her down the path of working for Merchant Skilled. So while I feel that Dr. Stone and Descendants of a Bookworm are in concept and a Peel kind of similar. It's just the presentation of what you might call masculine and feminine values that's different. Both of them are working to improve their new family's standard of living, just they're doing it at different levels of skill. But speaking of presentation between masculine and feminine values means that I have to talk about one more key difference between Senku and mine that is unfortunately inherent in gender bias male genius in the shonen genre. So by having Senku be a super genius, it makes him really cool to watch, but it also means that the average audience is going to be learning from him and not with him. If you want to look at it from a character viewer relationship perspective, then Senku is like the teacher and not a fellow student. He is the Miss Frizzle in this analogy to my Carlos. And unfortunately, if we're going to talk about uh, male geniuses in anime, that means that I have to go on a quick tangent about Naruto. So, uh, spoilers, I guess, for the tuning exam. Men get called geniuses a lot. In the real world, yes, and especially in anime. Insert exception that proves the rule, and then five counter examples to prove my point. Those of you who follow me on Tumblr will know that I've been rewatching Naruto for some depraved reason, and like Sasuke, Neji, Shikamaru are all referred to as geniuses, of which Shikamaru is the only one who really, by the definition of genius, should be referred to under that title. But also, like <laughs> 10 other male characters, that show really thrives on child prodigies. Like Kakashi is a genius, Orochimaru is a genius. Itachi is a genius. Everyone in this freaking world is a genius. That could possibly be a translation error from the word tensai um, being directly translated to genius. Maybe it just means very talented and it's not a one-to-one -one accurate translation, but I don't know. And what's worse is because Naruto was written by Kishimoto and Kishimoto cannot write women is that no woman in that show is ever referred to as a genius. What's more, in the original series, no girl is ever allowed to win a fight against a man. Ever. <laughs> Seriously, is the first definitive win for a woman against a man in that series Sakura against Asori in Shupiden? Like... Am I crazy? Am I insane? I'll admit that I was watching a version that cut almost all of the filler out of Naruto, and I skipped through the parts that I found boring, but seriously, that's like 140 episodes. Anyway, my point is to say that because of all that, I am in no way surprised that Senku is a genius and mine isn't. It's just another one of those things where girl geniuses are much less common than boy geniuses in media. Girls can be written as smart, sure, but they aren't usually referred to as geniuses, unless they're a heel-turning villain that needs to be put in their place. It's just one of those things that once it's pointed out to you, as it was to me in an art history class, you can't unsee it. Also, although it's a bit late at this point, I should probably make it clear that gender is a spectrum, and my intent is to never enforce gender roles, especially as someone that has very nebulous feelings about gender myself. But at the same time, I live in a society and culture that has some really firm 
form ideas about what gender is, and media doesn't exist in a vacuum. So whenever I talk about gender, just know that there should always be this little asterisk next to it, meaning generally speaking. Not true for everyone, but just in general. As far as the genius archetype usually goes, Senku is actually really well balanced in a way that makes him charismatic and likable. His affect may appear calculating and aloof, but the show goes way out of its way to enforce that Senku is still a human being who loves and deeply cares about his friends and their well-being. And that is very important to me, personally. Senku also ends up in the ambiguous ace category, where he is uninterested in romantic and possibly sexual relationships. This part is written less well and possibly even written unintentionally into the story as ace characters are often written as quote-unquote, too busy to waste time on something frivolous like love rather than, you know, how any other sexual identity would be, which is just how you are as a person. Even so, I still hope that Senku can remain on the ace spectrum and isn't, like, shoehorned into falling in love with Kohaku because she is a girl and she is there. A tale as old as time. Anyway, because Senku is less relatable, his internal struggles don't receive as much focus as mine. There are some fleeting moments of complex emotional turmoil, which I appreciate, but it's not the main focus, and the show generally tries to keep a lighthearted tone. Actually, on that note, this may just be me and my biases, but I think that Dr. Stone being a shonen battle series was actually to the story's detriment from a structural standpoint. Is Dr. Stone a shonen battle series? There's literally a tournament arc is it how do you class that is it a non-battle battle anime i don't know whatever when you break down shonen anime to their bare bones you have your hero who needs to defeat the evil villain and i think this is where bookworm has an edge over dr stone story-wise because the conflict isn't centered around a heel turning villain causing chaos but rather external and internal problems in the world Remember this chart of the odds stacked against a protagonist and how it creates long and short-term goals for each of them? A lot of mine's obstacles are complex structures or nebulous internal concepts like her own sickness and impoverished means as a helpless child. And that makes her growth more interesting. There's no mustache twirling villain. Well, okay, there are one or two mustache twirling villains, but it means that her problems don't have easy black and white solutions. Killing the bad guy will not make her problem go boom, which I unfortunately cannot say for Dr. Stone. Tsukasa is a bad villain with flimsy motivation, even for a genre that thrives on flimsy one-note villains. Like, oh really? You think all adults should be killed? Really? because an adult beat you up one time. And you don't think anyone you revive is going to have a problem with that? And also, what do you count as an adult? Anyone over 30? Are you seriously telling me that all these JoJo-looking henchmen are all sprightly 16-year-olds? Listen, man, I get it. I get that you're bitter about the ever-increasing wealth gap between the super-rich and middle-class citizens. And I'm as much for the beat-the-rich mentality as the next millennial, but like, <laughs> that doesn't mean you can go around murdering what are probably just overworked salary men. But Japes aside, even worse than that, he's just unnecessary for the story. Tsukasa just represents a ticking clock to put pressure on Senku's goals. But, <laughs> but the world already has a better villain baked into its premise. If mine's biggest obstacle to overcome is society, then Senku already has a great source of conflict, and it's nature. We even get to see a couple of episodes based on that premise when Senku and Ko try to collect water from a poisonous spring or the literal pitfalls of cave exploration. That's enough! You don't need some bad guy on top of that. 
You could even have a rival faction of people if there absolutely had to be a human threat, since the village Senku ends up in has explicitly stated that there were criminals that had been banished. This may not end up being true, but I really think that Tsukasa was only written into the story because that's just how shonen stories go. Heroes fight villains. And I don't know, maybe audiences are just more easily invested in a human antagonist than like, you know, a landslide or a natural disaster. But man, I don't know. I think the odds are so firmly stacked against Senku that he doesn't need a human threat on top of that. And I think that something unfeeling and natural like, you know, pneumonia is more threatening than like a big human with a knife. So... While I can remain excited for the eventual season 3 of Ascendance of a Bookworm, I'm not so sure I'm going to care for the second season of Dr. Stone, when the arc is called The Stone Wars. I don't mind some fighting or high-concept strategy tactics, but I really don't want the majority of the season to be that. There are plenty of other cool fighting anime that I could watch. I just want to watch a guy in a dress make some cool science-y stuff. But that's enough about Dr. Stone. Let's move on to the absolute non-wish fulfillment of Ascendance of a Bookworm. In my last video, the part one of this video, to very briefly summarize, I talked about the difference between the isekai genre in the 90s and the modern isekai boom. 90s isekai was less homogeneous as there were plenty of popular isekai being written by and or for women. Meanwhile, modern isekai, due in part to the hyper-popularity of Sword Art Online, became focused on stories that were extremely niche male power fantasies and were usually coupled with a harem for good measure. Finally, isekai became so popular that it created a space for a whole new subgenre of isekai subversions and parodies. What's so refreshing about Bookworm is that it feels like the author spent a lot of time thinking about things that are totally glossed over in any other isekai and gave those things weight and importance. Little things like having your brain auto-translate the language and having to relearn how to read and just being disgusted by medieval standards of hygiene. Shout out again to the novel of the Twelve Kingdoms because it is literally the only other isekai I have ever seen where they have addressed the language barrier as anything more than just flavor text. Bookworm's story poses some really refreshing questions about the isekai genre, like, what about your family? Do you miss them? Aren't you sad that you may never go back? Questions that I know I have asked myself when reading isekai, because the authors usually just pretend that the real world doesn't exist anymore once the protagonist has left it. And if those questions are even brought up at all, they're usually just hand-waved away by making the protagonist's home life just kind of sad. I would assume this is due at least partially because the audience is ostensibly living in the modern world and is using the isekai genre to briefly escape the pressures of modern life. But I think that only works if the protagonist is written as a self-insert. And honestly, I don't know about you, but I'm so tired of bland self-insert protagonists. Is it too much to ask to want to fall in love with a well-written, distinct individual and not a Narcissus-esque mirror of desire for once? Like, we can agree that self-inserts are boring at this point, right? Like, fan fiction is different. It's by nature supposed to be self-indulgent, chaser bliss, but we can't keep letting published authors slide on by copping out of writing an interesting protagonist. But that's why Bookworm makes such a refreshing addition to the isekai genre for so many reasons. And one is that I don't think there's actually any wish fulfillment in Ascendance of a Bookworm. Like, let's look at mine's circumstances. She lived most of her life as an adult woman who then abruptly died and then got reset into the body of a bedridden child. She's living with a family of what are effectively strangers who remember and care for her, but who she has only just met. Add on to that the fact that she is experiencing a very specific and unusual version of imposter syndrome because she has, in this case, literally replaced this family's real daughter and is an actual imposter. Plus the guilt she feels about that, along with this strange sickness that killed the child of the body that she is now basically possessing, 
and is eating her alive. There are also aspects of mind situation that are reminiscent of the Capgra delusion, because other characters who spend time with mine begin to realize that the way she acts sometimes is noticeably off. She knows things and acts in a way that don't make any sense for someone who is supposed to be a five-year-old child. And mine knows that if her secret is found out by her friends or family, that there's a good chance she will be accused of being a witch or a demon and she could be actually murdered. That's a lot. That's heavy and it's fascinating, but I don't think anyone would describe it as wish fulfillment. Since the odds are stacked so incredibly high against her, it makes it so satisfying to see mine work her way up the ladder, accumulating wealth and slowly improving her family's standard of live. Hold on. Hold everything. I was wrong. This is wish fulfillment. This is the Animal Crossing effect. Gee, mine, are you not satisfied with your house and your current standard of living? Better go into the woods and get some paper from the tree so you can trade it to Mr. Tom Nook and get a better house, mine. I'm kidding. Okay, maybe you could say that there is a small amount of wish fulfillment in the same way that, like, a cottage core has become a type of wish fulfillment for a lot of people during quarantine. But the main thing is, it's not a male power fantasy. I don't think mine could be more powerless and helpless if she tried. At least for now. Another thing that I love about Bookworm and how it deviates from the standard isekai genre is that in any other isekai, I, the audience member, would not be thinking very hard about the lore or how the world functions. I would assume that any important lore is just a set piece or plot dressing and it will either come back in a very heavy-handed narrative way or never be addressed again. But, uh, <laughs> the thing is, Bookworm's storytelling is just too good for that. Part of me really does wish I had the actual light novel the anime is based off of, since from what I've read of the manga, they do actually go a bit more into depth about the craftsmanship aspects of paper production. Like, mine knows in theory some of the steps about how paper is made, but in practice, she completely lacks the skills to reproduce the tools needed. The anime does kind of gloss over some of the detail work, like when they're working on the steamer or when they meet Frida and are trying to work out what type of hair ornament would be best. I understand that an anime adaptation cannot include everything from its original source material because that would be insane, but if I'm going to take the time to sit down and watch an anime that is basically there to explain how something is made, I want to know. I want to know in great detail. I want to see the trial and error and how complicated it is to make something from scratch that we now take completely for granted. You know, because I'm a nerd. But at the same time, I understand that is what the source material is there for. But listen, here's the thing. I love that Bookworm will just pull the rug from underneath you in a single moment, and your current understanding of how the world functions crumbles, and you realize you were missing a key piece of information all along that was, in fact, strategically kept from you to keep you in the dark and powerless. Like, okay, 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 here's a real thought I had while watching the series for the first time after it is revealed that magic is a thing that humans can have. Oh, okay, people can have magic. But wait, only nobles? Why? Is it genetic and passed down biologically? Well, how does mine have magic then? Does she have noble lineage in her past? Is it not genetic at all? Oh, okay, now I understand that is why. Yep, okay, got it. I absolutely refuse to spoil Bookworm's season one finale. You literally have to just watch it for yourself. I'm sorry, guys, just trust me on this for once. The answers to the questions that I had asked myself very early in the season were made very clear about why people with magic were at the top of this hierarchy, but made clear in a way that was told through action and through visual storytelling, not through exposition. And that is fantastic world building. Bookworm really takes its time exploring this very small part of the city that mine and we, the audience, are literally confined in. 
we not only get the sense of how hard upward mobility is for the average citizen in this world, but also by only showing us slivers of the world at a time, it means that when a major reveal happens, it hits so much harder. Because it's not just information that's being withheld from the audience, but it's being withheld from a whole class of people for what are usually really unsavory reasons. Which, from a narrative perspective, works perfectly in tandem with Mind's endless thirst for knowledge and her end goal, which is the production of a modern printing press, which would make what was up until this point considered a luxury item for only the privileged and make it accessible to the working class, spurring a new age of literacy and knowledge for a people that are, you know, being oppressed by the privileged noble class. The press would create a renaissance and be the impetus for a new era of mass communication and would bolster the emergence of the middle class and create revolution and... I'm sorry, I'm not... I'm not sorry. I don't think people understand how big of a deal this is and whenever I try to pitch the show to a friend and explain that it's about a little girl spending 12 episodes trying to make paper, I can see the light fade from their eyes. I just... I think reading is cool. Mind's passion and her single-minded motivation being her love of reading line up with what her goal will eventually do, which is make literacy and books available for all people in spite of social or economic class. That's really good narrative synchronicity. And Mind's enthusiasm for reading is absolutely infectious, and as someone who can sometimes get tunnel vision about the things that they are passionate about, <clears throat> uh, she's really relatable. And also, she's just adorable. Look at her. I love watching Mine's father be completely overprotective and his absolute adoration for his daughters. I like watching Turi do her best to be a responsible older sister for her sibling who does not make her job very easy. I love seeing Ava's unconditional love for her children, as she not only takes care of the household, but also takes care of them. I like watching her friendship grow with the neighborhood boy Lutz, as the more time that they spend together, Lutz becomes Mine's sole confidant. As, by working together, they both are able to make each other's dreams come true. I simply find that wonderful, and I don't know if you've managed to figure this out about my preferences by now, but... If it's not about found families, what even is the point? But I don't know, maybe that's just my weird tastes. But uh, speaking of weird tastes, I feel like I have to add a disclaimer that mine getting a case of the Detective Conan syndrome, an adult being transformed into a child and hence almost never being taken seriously and having to walk a careful line lest their secret be discovered, uh, it's not for any unsavory reasons. There may be a small amount of moe appeal, but it's all very wholesome. Oh God, I hate that I even have to add that as a disclaimer. Anime was a mistake. I feel like I'm having a hard time articulating why Bookworm is so good, but to me, it really feels like the perfect spiritual successor to all those female-led isekai of the early 90s that just seemed to fizzle out in the 2000s. It just, it makes me feel like Gordon Ramsay, finally, some good fucking isekai. So yeah, I love Bookworm and Dr. Stone. And if any of that sounded interesting, give one or both of them a try. Uh, but there is one last thing I do feel like I have to mention. And it's that both their anime adaptations look like ass. Presentation in anime adaptation. Now, full disclosure, this part is basically all just speculation. Because trying to find out what an anime's actual budget is, is basically impossible. And each episode is going to have a different level of effort put into it depending on its importance to the story anyway. But as a rule of thumb, the first and last episodes in a season are usually higher quality. Without being able to compare the actual numbers in each show's budget, we're going to have to use a very unscientific method, which is just vibes. And for the sake of simplicity, since this video has once again gone completely out of control lengthwise, we're just going to compare the openings. And I'm sure that you can probably already tell, but a sentence of a bookworm's opening looks like ass. And the thing is, I don't even necessarily think that Dr. Stone has a really high budget. 
I would say that it just looks like a good shonen anime. Nothing mind-blowing, just competent. But even then, it is leagues above bookworm, like the lighting and particle effects and transitions are just mwah. I am by no means an animation studio buff. I might be able to name a couple of anime studios off the top of my head, but I wouldn't really say that I know the industry very well. Looking at the studio that produced Ascendance of a Bookworm's portfolio of other works, it does not seem like they are very prolific. Besides Bookworm, there are only a couple of other names of anime that I recognize. Meanwhile, the studio behind Dr. Stone, TMS Entertainment, they are not only much more prolific, but their works have significantly more clout behind them. For instance, they were behind the new Fruits Basket anime, Megalobox, Yoma Wushi Petal, oh sweetness and lightning, hell yeah! So again, while this is just speculation on my part, it seems evident that the anime adaptation for Dr. Stone probably definitely has a higher budget than Bookworm. This probably has something to do with how popular the source material is, and since Dr. Stone's manga is being serialized in Shonen Jump, that automatically gives it a step up over a ton of other series. But I don't think that's the only reason. Bookworm did not start out as a manga, it actually was a light novel and then got adapted into a manga. So do light novel adaptations have less of a budget in general? Well, no, because again, Sword Art Online had enough of a budget to completely reshape the isekai genre, and that started out as a light novel. Hmm, what could it be? Again, this part of the video is firmly into tinfoil hat territory. I don't have any evidence for this, but my guess would be this. It's because the main character is a girl, it's probably written by a woman, and the focus of the story is on the quote-unquote feminine aspects of starting a new life in a medieval world. Okay, so I have to mention that when doing research on Japanese authors, it can sometimes be very hard to figure out what gender they are. In Japan, it's quite common to use a pen name, and Mia Kazuki is a very private person to begin with, so information on them is kind of sparse. They have a Twitter, but I can't read Japanese. Though looking at their Twitter makes a lot of sense. There are a lot of like hurdy gurdies and medieval manuscripts, and like, oh yeah, duh, they must vibe with medieval history. Obviously, it all makes sense now. All this to say, while there are some sources out there that state that she's female, a lot of them are just blank gender-wise. So I really don't want to speculate on someone's gender when I don't actually know. That's kind of an uncool thing to do. But at the same time, Ascendance of a Bookworm just feels like it does not have the male gaze in it. I feel like that's something when you are a female fan, particularly of something like anime, you get really good at picking out. So full disclosure, I could be completely wrong. This is just what I feel. I feel it in my guts like an old sailor sensing a storm coming on the wind. I don't know, it just feels so obvious to me that the show clearly has more of an appeal towards the feminine. But, do you know what the light novel and manga's target demographic is listed towards? The light novel is listed as male, and then the manga is listed as seinen, as in young adult men. Now that... that's weird to me. Do you know what some other seinen anime are? I'll name some. One Punch Man, Outlaw Star, Helsing, Tokyo Ghoul, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, fucking berserk! Hmm... That doesn't seem right to me. Okay, okay, okay. Well, then what about Jose? Let me name some popular anime for young women. Ah. There's nothing here! Okay, okay, so I actually talked about the shonen versus shoujo and the seinen versus Jose at length in my previous video, but I was actually waiting to talk about Bookworm to bring this up. And that is, how does an anime or manga get sorted into its genre or demographic? For a manga, it's a bit easier to parse, as magazines like Shonen Jump or Ribbon are already split into target demographics. 
So the shonen and shoujo genre really just mean that's the target demographic the series is being marketed to. But as I was doing research, I came up with a theory. Remember when I said that girls are more willing to watch content made for boys and boys are much less likely to do the same? I think that sometimes it's easier for a show to market itself as shonen so that boys will give it a chance and watch it, even though it may also perform equally well, if not better, with a female audience. My reasoning for this is because the shonen tag has shows like Nichijo, Toilet Bound Hanako-kun, and The Ancient Magus Bride, which, again, to me, it just doesn't feel right. The key thing about Ascendance of a Bookworm is that it was first published as a free-to-read novel before it was officially published as a light novel and marketed towards the male demographic. And I have a feeling it was for that very reason. I also think that may be part of the problem of why there are so few Jose anime. It's because a large portion of male anime fans won't watch them. So production companies can't rely on the male otaku fanbase to buy hundreds of body pillows or the new saber figurine or whatever. I didn't mean that, King. I love you. (sighs) Then there's just less money put into it, which means less quality, which means that people like me who are genuinely interested in something like a sense of a bookworm can't get someone like, again, say their brother to watch it with them, even though they had both independently watched all of Dr. Stone. I get that Bookworm isn't as flashy as something like Demon Slayer, but I don't know. I'm really tired of Sakuga being reserved for fight scenes. Like, there's no reason Sakuga cannot be used to convey how delicious a meal could be, or the complex grief a character is feeling, or breathe life into a world and making it feel real and lived in instead of filling it with stock CGI background characters walking around! I'm really glad that despite its visuals being somewhat lackluster, Bookworm's story is good enough that it has received enough attention from the anime community that it didn't just slip away into obscurity. I just wish I didn't have to explain myself for 40 minutes to explain why you should watch it, when all I have to do is look over at Dr. Stone's success and think about what could have been. If, maybe, in another world, Ascendance of a Bookworm were given more love and attention. I wish Ascendance of a Bookworm were as beautiful as it could be, and that you didn't have to watch it in spite of its flaws. And I wish that there will be more anime like Ascendance of a Bookworm in the future, and I wish that they will be better. But until that day comes, fellas, I'll just have to keep talking about underappreciated magical girl anime from the 90s. Soon.